much for being here. This is our May 14th Frank Talks, and we are very pleased to be here at Columbia State, and would like to thank them very much for the opportunity to be at this beautiful location. I am um, Dolores Greenwald. I'm the director of the Williamson County Public Library. Who has library cards? I always ask. Okay, very good. All right. Also, I would like to thank Vanderbilt University Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations, and the ever perfect Miss Lynn Maddox is here with us today. And, <laughs> and also, I would like to thank Renaissance Bank, and um, last but not least, I would like to thank our coffee per uh, service this morning, Community Coffee, with Brian. And I tell you, he is making a dent already here in Williamson County. And I found out a secret this morning about Brian's coffee. Well, most people know Community Coffee is in Louisiana, right? But they're also the coffee of Cafe Du Mans, too. I knew it tasted really good, and I knew it tasted familiar this morning. So now, um, I would like to welcome also the ever-present and ever-perfect Miss Nancy Conway. We are starting a new tradition here with our Frank Talks, and Nancy is a part of that, so welcome, Nancy. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Morning. Well, the new segment is a brief one at the beginning of Frank Talks each time. And the title is A Question, Did You Know? Okay, this is a history question. So, I, they did not tell me if there's a prize for the person that has the correct answer. <laughs> But I'm sure it's free admission to the next session of Frank Talks. <laughs> um, the question today is, what is the longest running community event in Williamson County? Oh, and yeah. it is? That is correct. The answer is the Franklin Noon Rotary Club Rodeo. And of course it's set for this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at the Williamson County Ag Expo Center on Long Lane in South Franklin. Now, a little information about the rodeo. Since 1949, we've had the Cowboys and Cowgirls all stampeding to Franklin for the rodeo in early May. And it's always been a tremendous success even when uh, it was outside and it rained. But it has provided over six decades of excitement and entertainment. The rodeo, or uh, actually the Rotary Club, was chartered January 13th, 1948, with 14 members. And then Judge Jim Warren served as the club's first president. And this was truly a historical moment, really, in the history of Franklin and Williamson County. Now, it hasn't always been at the Ag Center. Proud of that, it was at the Jim Warren Park. And I've heard some people say that proud of that, it was at what they call, uh, goodness, the area off of Natchez and Folk Street where you turn in today to go down to the county communi uh, community services building. It was back in that area. I know the rescue squad had a brief area there as well as, uh, the uh, Rotarians for the rodeo. Okay, on with it. Jim Hayes has mentioned to some people that he could remember when one man, Dr. Harry Guffey, had actually seen a rodeo, and the only person in the area that they knew of that had seen a rodeo. And he, along with John and Preston folks, and Bob Corley, were the principals in carrying the torch at the time. And if you can believe this, another significant person in the rodeo uh, work was our famous, the late Ed Moody that we all loved, who managed the rodeo, if you can believe it, 
from the 1950s until 1984. So stay tuned for next month's trivia historical question. We have two rodeo tickets to give away. And we had two people that answered. Brandy Ann, who was the other person? Well, speak up. Don't be bashful. Common? Alderman Brady Blatton says, give them to whomever. <laughs> okay? Who's your first time here at Rainbow? Hmm? She just asked, first time here, there's no one. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Let's move on. All right. Let's move Good morning, I'm Lynn Maddox. I am co-chair with Dolores for Frank Talks and we just wanted to welcome you again today. And as well, we're welcoming our panelists if they'd like to come forward. Um, and I would like to say thank you to Columbia State and Shauna Jackson is gonna do a brief welcome and then I'll introduce our panelists if they wanna come forward. Panelists, there they come. <laughs> thank you, Lynn. Good morning and welcome to the Williamson campus of Columbia State. Uh, this is a special place to me. I've been with Columbia State since 2010 and some people know but this is like my last day. Tomorrow will be my last day here and I'll be headed towards Nashville State Community College. So I'm so glad I had the opportunity to give a small welcome today to tell you a little bit about the campus and also my love for Franklin tomorrow. Um, I was actually on the board when Mindy Tate came up with the idea to do Frank Talks. I think it's been three years now. And it started very slow, just a couple of events. And so to see this room and to see the diversity of the topics and the wonderful things that have been happening, Mindy was right on. And this is a great thing and I'm sure it will continue. So we're glad you're here on the campus. Uh, it opened in fall of 2016. It is the first phase of a nine building campus. So these three buildings are just the beginning. We've had some record enrollment every year, and we're already up about 200 um, point to point of where we were last year. So we're hoping for another year of being over 2,000 students that we serve. So we're glad you're here. I cannot stand in front of you without doing a quick commercial for Tennessee Reconnect. Uh, for those of you that are, are not aware, many people are aware of the Tennessee Promise, which is for the high school students. Starting this fall, adults who do not have a degree, an associate's degree, bachelor's degree, no degree, can come back to community college, come right back to Columbia State, tuition and mandatory fee free. The program is for at least six hours a semester for five years. So if you or a relative or a friend or whoever you may know hasn't taken the opportunity, you've got an absolute wonderful opportunity to come back even if you have 30, 40 credit hours um, and complete your associate's degree. So I'm sure that was more than Franklin tomorrow wanted me to say, but I can't stand in front of a room of adults and not mention that wonderful opportunity. So enjoy the rest of the program and thank you for letting us host it today. Thank you, Shauna. It's been such an honor to be um, part of all that you've done for Columbia State and thank you for that. And uh, speaking selfishly from Vanderbilt, we're just thrilled that she's going to be in Nashville. So um, today we are going to talk about the high points, how Williamson County is hitting the high points, literally. Our goal is to take a fun look at some of Williamson County's geographically highest points, but also some of the landmark locations for tourism in our county, as well as the vertical growth of downtown Franklin. And we will begin. Um, to my left um, is our incoming president of Franklin Tomorrow, Alina Bell. And next to her is Steve Bland, Steve Bacon, Chief Operating Officer for Harpeth Square, a $100 million plus mixed use project in downtown Franklin involving high-end multifamily Hilton Curio Hotel, office retail, restaurant, and structured parking. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Next to him is Tony Turnbow, president of the Natchez Trace Parkway Association, where he is working with the National Park Service to develop programs including 
trail fitness, cycling safety, living history, and an interpretation using smartphones. And next to Tony, or welcome Tony, and next to Tony is Matt Maxey, the storyteller of the Williamson County Convention and Visitors Bureau. <laughs> welcome, and Alina, will you get us started? Yes. Thank you. We're so glad you're here today, and we're so glad to have our panelists here. Steve, if you don't mind, will you just, um, and I'll let each one proceed and just giving a 10 minute overview and letting us know a little bit about who you are and maybe how you came into the position. And if it includes a video, um, here's the uh, video. Okay. Morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right, I got to watch that. I'm Steve Bacon. I'm the COO of Harpeth Associates. We're uh, developing Harpeth Square, which is the mixed use project in downtown. First, I'm just going to go over the four main components of our project and then sort of talk about some unique features of what we're doing and then sort of end with uh, a discussion about height as it relates to downtown Franklin. Uh, first, about five years ago, we bought our first lot in uh, Franklin. That uh, is one of ten lots that we bought that will comprise Harpeth Square. And after that time, we started uh, forming the design team, most of who live in downtown Franklin. And then as we were uh, uh, in charge of these design team, we, we told them that we had, to build a, we had to design a building that would fit in the most historic district in the state, as we felt. And we think they did a good job. And since Franklin was so easy to build in, it just took us four and a half years and 36 <laughs> meetings to get to this point. We feel we've been at it a very long time. But the parts of, uh, of our development, uh, the hotel is the most uh, interesting part that uh, most people gravitate toward. It's a 119 room uh, Hilton Hotel, which uh, Curio, which is the highest uh, boutique brand that Hilton has. They'll have a restaurant on the north side of the hotel with a separate identity. It'll be a high-end restaurant uh, with private booths and seating on the outside and in the front. It'll have a whiskey tasting room. It'll have some neat features that uh, I don't think are currently offered in downtown. And then on the south side of the hotel toward Landmark Books, Landmark Bank, will be a European style cafe. It'll be a sort of subway tile where you can buy um, packaged food, pastries, uh, have a drink. Um, and it'll also have seating on the outside uh, on the side and on the front. And then in the middle of the uh, first floor, we have the lobby bar. Um, we have the uh, library that will be with a fireplace in there. And then uh, probably the most important thing of the hotel is our two main design features. One is the front porch that you typically don't see. But on the front of the uh, hotel, you'll see three levels of porches. And I'll help provide those six suites on each floor, a place to go outside and have a good vista of downtown Franklin. And also another important design feature of downtown, um, excuse me, of the hotel will be our courtyard. So when you go into the, when you go in the door of the hotel, you'll be able to see through the lobby, see through the upper lobby, and then out to this open air courtyard. And in the back of the open air courtyard will be a grand staircase going up to an upper courtyard. So that, that courtyard that a lot of the units will look at is sort of our main feature along with uh, the front porch. The, uh, in addition to the restaurants, in addition to the library, we have a private, uh, excuse me, we have a ballroom that will sit about 250 people for a meeting and about 175 for a sit down meal. And in addition to that, we have two private boardrooms where we can have uh, rooms, meetings up to 16 people. And a neat, neat feature of the uh, ballroom is the, uh, is the pre-function area. So if you're in a meeting and you take a break, you can go out the pre-function area and then you can go out to the open air courtyard where you can get a drink, you could uh, eat, and then you go back into your meeting. So we're excited about that. And, that's, that's, and the hotel is called the Harpeth. The, uh, on the multifamily side, we have 150 units. Uh, it's a little different in that we have more two bedrooms than one bedrooms. We think we'll attract probably an older crowd. The, uh, the apartments are all concrete. They're six foot corridors, uh, 10 foot ceilings on the second, third, and fourth floor. 
and 13 foot ceilings on the first floor. The, uh, the apartments will have a clubhouse, will have a courtyard like the hotel has a courtyard, um, and a, along with a fitness center and a dog wash area and the things you typically see in a, a, a multifamily setting. The unique feature of the, ho of the apartments is that for a, some kind of nominal amount, you'll be able to uh, access the hotel amenities. So for, say, $100, you'll be able to get it. You'll have an uh, access card. You'll be able to get into the hotel, and you'll be able to uh, enter uh, and go down the elevator, and you'll be in the, uh, where the restaurant is or the cafe. And you can also order room service from your apartment. You can order have maid service in your apartment and uh, valet parking. So that all that has been a, has been a real popular as we take reservations. The third part of the uh, development is the retail and office space. We have about 18,000 square feet of retail and office space. We're at 37% pre-lease right now, and we've got a lot of interest. We'll have uh, a lot of the space will be taken by uh, per professional services, probably a hair salon and, and some other office space. And our, our goal is also to find a market on the corner and we're in negotiations right now where you can buy prepackaged food, a deli sandwich, but also buy, pick up a bottle of wine and everything downtown. So again, we're excited about that. Uh, and the fourth part of the development is the garage. It, so 597 cars, which is about the size of both city garages combined today. So uh, it's a fairly large uh, garage. It's a cast. It's a it's, it's a uh, cast in place. We actually built it there. We didn't do precast. And the neat feature of the garage is that we uh, mirrored the same height of the apartment. So the first level of that garage is 16 feet, and it goes 10 feet and 10 feet up. That means if you live on the fourth floor and you park in your, uh, on the fourth floor, you get out of your car, you go straight into the corridor and you're not going down any steps. So um, that's, that's, uh, that's the, four, the four parts of the development. Some of the unique features of, uh, of the project includes that hotel amenities, which I already talked about. Uh, also, uh, the whole development is sitting on 1,600 piers. Uh, uh, when we did our geotests, Geotech test, uh, bedrock's down about 14 feet, and because we were doing a concrete building, we, uh, which is a heavy building, we had to set everything on deep foundations. So that whole place is sitting on these 1,600 piers going down into the bedrock. So I think we're okay if something happens earthquake-wise. <laughs> uh, last thing, or one of the things, is that you'll probably see on Bridge Street now, there's two very large uh, concrete walls right across the McConnell House. And that's our breezeway that we're building into the courtyard. So if you were at the McConnell House and you look straight across and through that breezeway, you'll see the fountain in the middle of the apartments go straight into the clubhouse. And then above that breezeway is three levels of apartments with the penthouse being on the top. That just, it does go to the height that we have uh, there. Uh, talk about discussions on height. Uh, let me see. Go through here. <coughs> I can hear you too. If you need me to. Just maybe play that drum. First, about height. Uh, when we started designing the, uh, the building and the project, we kept referring back to a, a committee that was formed in 2009 in the city of Bowman members, uh, planning commission members, city staff, and citizens. And they came up with a recommendation to Boma that the height in downtown of new buildings shall not be taller than the Masonic Lodge. It's 56 feet. So that was our limit. We could not go above 56 feet. And that still exists today. Uh, the 231 building is under 56 feet. We're under 56 feet. In fact, we're probably about 52 feet. Uh, so we always had to adhere to that height. In fact, when we went in, we were innumerable meetings, uh, we pulled back our fourth floor on Main Street, and we pulled it back on Bridge Street, and we pulled it back on Second Avenue. We did that to sort of uh, lessen the impact of the height. So as we talk about height, we did have a lot of discussions about this about three years ago. 
And the one area that that committee in 2009 came up with that would be appropriate for a four-story would be east of 2nd Avenue. Well, we're east of 2nd Avenue. So as we talk again about the height, the only areas in downtown that I see that could ever have a height uh, like we do or like 231 would be east of 2nd Avenue. That might be the silos and that maybe potentially could be, I guess, City Hall. I'm not for sure. But uh, uh, let me play. I, I, we did a drone shot about a month ago. And Carmen, if you could start that. And I apologize about this music. So we'll kind of, this gives you a visual in downtown. Thank you very much, Steve. Tony? Good morning. I'm Tony Turnbow. I'm president of the Natchez Trace Parkway Association. We're the friends group for the Natchez Trace Parkway, and I've been involved with... Free commercial. I didn't know. Do have a PowerPoint presentation. Let her yes. shift over there. To that. <laughs> okay. Uh, but this is where I met Nancy Conway back in the 1980s. She was president of the Natchez Trace Parkway, and um, she is uh, probably the, I'm not sure how to say, the longest serving board member that we have uh, for the Natchez Trace Parkway Association. So she's been involved since about 1986, I think. But if I were here this morning to tell you that Williamson County is getting a brand new national park or a brand new national scenic trail like the Appalachian Trail or the Pacific Crest Trail, everybody would be excited, thinking about the potential for tourism, the potential for recreation, for education. And in a sense, I'm doing that because a lot of people don't realize that we have a national park and a national scenic trail in our own backyard. If I were to ask you what you think of when you think of a national park, a lot of you would think of maybe the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, Yellowstone, and you don't think about, if I can turn this. <clears throat> okay. And you don't think about the Natchez Trace Parkway. Um, and if you compare the number of visitors 
to the Natchez Trace Parkway with the other more iconic parks, we have more visitation. The Natchez Trace Parkway is the eighth most visited national park unit in the U.S. And this doesn't include commuters. There's another six million commuters. You just don't see that many people out there at one given time because it stretches over 444 miles from Nashville to Natchez, Mississippi. The economic impact, this was from a study just released, uh, about 2,000 jobs along the Natchez Trace Parkway, about $154 million to the local communities. And I hope that Franklin gets its share of that tourism. But I'm here this morning to tell you more about the quality of life benefits that we have for the Natchez Trace Parkway. You know, a lot of you think of it as just a road, a two-lane road, it's a long drive from here to Natchez, and we don't think about the other qualities that it has. There are a lot of people who tell me, I serve as a lawyer in my day job, that they go to the Natchez Trace to unwind. And that's one of the reasons it exists as a national park. It's a place to connect back with nature. In fact, if you have told me that psychiatrists have prescribed visits to the Natchez Trace Parkway, it's, it's free medicine, a place to connect with nature. And it is a gorgeous drive. If you've been out at certain times of the day, you know, it is one of the most beautiful parks that we have uh, anywhere around. Williamson County is, is blessed to have some of the, the great uh, roadscape that was done for uh, the Natchez Trace. And in any season, you know, the, the double arch bridge is one of the most well-known features that we have here in Williamson <coughs> County. Um, and people come from all over to see this, which is the first of its kind in the United States. But the road leads to a lot of great landscapes uh, for the Tennessee, Middle Tennessee area, such as this one at the Water Valley Overlook, uh, to great streams, things, the, the kind of views that you might expect at other national parks across the country. You can find those along the Natchez Trace and the way to connect with nature, with the deer and the turkey that are here in Williamson County. But we also have the Natchez Trace National Scenic Trail that almost no one knows exists. It was one of the first national trails that was uh, created by Congress back in 1983, along with the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail. Uh, but more of our emphasis for so long was on developing the road, getting the road completed, or the pavement completed. And the national trail took a, kind of a backseat to that development. But the Congress designated that the Natchez Trace National Scenic Trail would be eventually 600 miles of trail from Nashville to Natchez. Only about 70 miles of that trail had been constructed so far 24 miles of that are in Tennessee, and the northern trailhead is just south of Leaper's Fork at Garrison Creek, and this is the northern trailhead. If you go from the trailhead up to the top of the hill, it's about a 200-foot climb. Um, the Old Natchez Trace, about two miles of the Old Natchez Trace are on top of the hill. So you get a chance to experience what it was like to walk on the Old Natchez Trace a couple hundred years ago. It leads to a beautiful overlook, overlooking the area where the old garrison was from the 1700s. That's, they gave Garrison Creek its name. It's also a place for horseback riding. In fact, the trail was built by people in Williamson County. The Tennessee Natchez Trace Trailblazers Association built it as an equestrian trail, but it's also used for hiking. It leads down to Burns Branch here in Williamson County. So it's a great place for people to go just to unwind, to connect with nature, um, and it's good psychologically as well for their health. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the history of the Natchez Trace. It's kind of the untold story and some of the new stories that we can tell about Williamson County. We got some great stories that have never been told before. Um, back when the Cumberland Settlement was just being created in the 1780s, 1770s, uh, this was Chickasaw land. And in 1781, Chickasaw Chief Piamingo met with James Robertson, the founder of Nashville, and suggested that they build a shorter route between the Cumberland Settlement in Nashville and the Chickasaw Nation Center in Pontotoc, Mississippi. And they began, they agreed, by treaty, and they began to create this new trail between Nashville and Pontotoc that we now consider the Natchez Trace, generally that, that route. This tree behind me was sometimes called pointer trees. It's the way that the Indians marked the trail to let people know which direction to take. Uh, they would bend the tree when it was young. As they got older, they could follow the, the pointers. This is on top of the hill out at, uh, at Garrison Creek. Uh, and you may have heard of Bending Chestnut Road in Williamson County, and the story is that's where it got its name. That it was one of those trees that they bent along the old Indian Trail. So the old Natchez Trace itself is one of the four oldest trails in North America. This trail that came through Franklin, right through the middle of Franklin, was an Indian trail. It grew in significance in about 1801. George Washington, when he was president, wanted to create a military road from Kentucky to the Gulf Coast. He had to be able to move soldiers in order to defend the Gulf Coast, and they needed a wagon road to be able to do that. He wasn't successful, but when Thomas Jefferson became president, 1801, 
he began the construction of one of the first, if not the first, federal wagon highways in the United States. It was the first road built for wheels developed by the federal government, and it came right through the middle of Franklin. That wasn't the plan, though. The, the plan was that it was going to be built about five miles to the west because that was the most direct route. And, and they were so anxious to begin constructing it, they began building that road even before they had the treaty with the Chickasaw Nation. People in, in Williamson County, um, it's, some things don't change. They own land in Franklin. They said Fra Franklin is the commerce center of the, of the county. Why build a road five miles to the west of where everybody has valuable land? Why don't you move the land? Why don't you move the, the road west through Franklin? And we're not really sure how it happened. Andrew Jackson owned land, John Overton owned land, and somehow that road got moved uh, to Franklin. So we have the old road going through Leaper's Fork, going through Old Town, that was cleared by the soldiers, but the soldiers were pulled off of that construction project and then put on to developing a wagon highway on South Hall Road going directly through Franklin. And so Franklin, part of its, important part of its history is the old Natchez Trace. It was a Natchez Trace town, and that was one of the reasons that Franklin developed um, as quickly as it did, because it had that connection with the southern Mississippi area and the Gulf Coast. Another part of that story, and this is kind of a blurry image from the Library of Congress, when they began to develop this wagon highway, that Colonel Thomas S. Butler, who was the second in command of the U.S. Army, was in, directed to uh, build this wagon highway. He brought 200 soldiers to Williamson County, 200 soldiers and their families, and they built huts called the, the Butler Cantonment for them to live in while they constructed this wagon highway. And they began to construct this road in Franklin. So that's a very important part of the early Franklin history that we've not told yet. Also, because of this road was here, there are lots of great stories with Andrew Jackson. I was just telling Steve, you know, Andrew Jackson across the road is the old, old jail. And that was the first building, the building that preceded that was the first building in Franklin called White's Tavern. And, and Andrew Jackson and Thomas Hart Benton used to frequent that uh, tavern quite a bit. And Jackson raced his racehorses on that street outside where the old, old Bridge Street, where the old, old jail is now. So it'd be a great story to tell at, at the Harper. Um, but it's an important part of this early history. And Thomas Hart Benton, who was very much part of this, his family developed what is now Leaper Swark. His mother moved here as a widow. Uh, she developed a town around it. He lived there. He served under Andrew Jackson, and he was known as a man of great ambition. And you can see him there at the literal edge of the U.S. settlement uh, in, the, in the early 1800s. And he had so much ambition that he moved to Missouri, became a U.S. senator, and served as a very influential senator during the 1800s, and was so ambitious that he actually, this man from Williamson County, helped push the boundaries of the U.S. to the Pacific Ocean. And that's a story that we need to tell. Thomas Hart Benton in, in Franklin. So the Natchez Trace has all these great stories that, that we can use to educate people about our early history. And you can see remnants of the old Natchez Trace in various areas. In Williamson County, we're still driving on a lot of the old Natchez Trace. The Park Service says it disappeared back into the woods, but we're still driving on most of it. In fact, it's still called the old Natchez Trace. It parts in Williamson County. They built taverns or inns along the road. And then during the War of 1812, Thomas Jefferson's vision proved to be correct. This road that Thomas Jefferson built through Williamson County, through Franklin, as soldiers were used, they were mustered in Franklin, they were marched down the Natchez Trace to defeat the British at the Battle of New Orleans. And because of that road, they were able to do that. So this road played a very important part in American history to help reestablish our independence from Britain. And that's an important story that we can tell. The Natchez Trace Parkway Association has just begun a program to mark the old Natchez Trace off the parkway with these markers that really emphasize the fact that it is a road built for wheels by Thomas Jefferson that we're still using today. And that's, that's one of our programs to mark its history. The other important point here in Williamson County is the War of 1812 Memorial Site. The, the Natchez Trace Parkway was built as a national park in large part as a War of 1812 park to emphasize the fact that Jackson marched his soldiers to win this victory over New Orleans. And there was no place on the parkway where they really told that story. There was a beautiful site here just south of Leaper's Fort on top of a hill uh, with, a, with a rock wall. And we said, why don't we, why don't we honor the soldiers from the War of 1812 here at that site? And about three or four years ago during the bicentennial of the War of 1812, we did. We created the War of 1812 Memorial Site. And it is one of the sites where the U.S. Daughters of 1812 come to honor the soldiers who marched along the Natchez Trace, who died along the Natchez Trace. That memorial is here in Williamson County. There's a lot that we can do to develop that War of 1812 story. One of the ways you can do it today is with the cell phone tour that we are developing. Uh, you, can, you can download this tour, go to our website, and you can watch videos that tell you the story of the Natchez Trace and this site during the War of 1812. That's uh, NATR 
www.onsell.com. Um, in addition to history, though, one of the things we're doing is to bring the history to life for students. Uh, we have reenactors who will portray historical characters along the Natchez Trace. We've had several thousand students that we've educated, and we're working with the, the Indian nations, the Chickasaw, Choctaw, Cherokee, uh, Shawnee, uh, to really tell their stories as well as, as the other stories along the Natchez Trace to these students uh, over the different events that we've had. It, it is great to go to these events because the kids leave it after, after seeing the history, hearing the history, even the smells of the horses and the history, they come away with their eyes this big and they say, that, that was awesome. You know, and how often do you hear kids say, that history was awesome. Uh, so when they go back to the classrooms, it's a great way to experience it. One of the local reenactors here in front is Brian Laster from Franklin. He has uh, taken on uh, an interest in historical surveying, and he has now taken on the character of Colonel Thomas S. Butler and will begin to portray him at the living history event, such as the one we have coming up in June. I'll tell you about in just a moment. The kids learn to love to learn about lacrosse, they have it developed from the Indian culture. And then we also have a great place for cycling, as most of you know. Uh, most cyclists from around the world put the Natchez Trace Parkway on this bucket list because they say it's a place you can go, you can put your mind on autopilot, and it's just a straight shot. You don't have to worry about where you're going or, or a map that you have. We've also created, working with a group to create the Natchez Trace 444, which is all 444 miles in 44 hours, uh, from the Loveless Cafe in Nashville down to Natchez, Mississippi. The first year we did it, this gentleman did it in 21 hours on a bike, which is pretty amazing. So that will be coming up again in early October. Uh, we're also, as you know, we've had some safety issues with cars on the Natchez Trace. And so one of the things we're doing is trying to encourage cyclists to make themselves as visible as possible with as high visibility clothing and lights on their bikes, which would be more effective. We're also putting up signs uh, just to make motorists more aware that there are cyclists on the parkway. Williamson County has taken advantage of the Natchez Trace uh, by building Timberland Park, which if you've not been there, it's a beautiful facility. Nancy and Judy and John Wisdom that a few years ago were very instrumental in that with some others. And they really give an idea of what this national park can become. It's, it's a great, they have several miles of trail, I think about six miles of trail there. They want to extend more, and they want to eventually connect it up with this Natchez Trace National Scenic Trail System that we have. And we hope in the future this will just become one of the several trail hubs that we have along this Natchez Trace National Scenic Trail. Talk about the, the trail ahead we already have. It begins at Garrison Creek. And you can see from this map how it starts there. And the trail runs generally along the Natchez Trace Parkway. It's never very far away. It's a, it's a fairly level trail, so it's a great uh, trail for families to use together. It goes all the way to Duck River, about 24 miles south, which is one of the most scenic rivers that we have in Tennessee. Uh, and to develop this trail a couple of years ago, we held a National Trails Conference in Franklin. This is John Jarvis, the director of the National Park Service. And we had trails directors who would come here and advise us on how we need to develop the trail. June 2nd, you'll have a chance to experience the trail, and I invite you to come out. Uh, it's the 50th anniversary of the National Trails Act, and it's also National Trails Day, and the National Park Service is celebrating that here in Franklin uh, with an event on, on the uh, National Scenic Trail. Uh, you'll be able to hike with a ranger, hike with the Chickasaw. The Chickasaw Nation is bringing one of their interpreters to, you can experience it from the Chickasaw perspective. Hike through history, Brian will portray Colonel Thomas S. Butler, and hike for fitness. And that's free and open to the public. There are flyers out there, and I would encourage you to, to participate in that. We're also creating a trail volunteer program, if your company is interested. We have 24 miles of trail, and to help the Park Service maintain it, we've divided it up into two-mile segments. And various groups are taking on two-mile segments. The Park Service will train them to maintain the trail. They'll walk it a couple times a year to do light maintenance. That will help keep the trail in pristine condition. Uh, we also finally will have, we're working on a program with, uh, we hope, with hospitals and insurance companies to encourage people to use the trail to become physically fit. Because there, there are benefits they can get through long distance hiking that you can't get anywhere else. And that's something else that we're developing along the Natchez Trace Parkway. So I'm happy to introduce our new national park and new national scenic trail. Let's take advantage of it. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Matt? That's um, Matthew Maxey, uh, official title at the Williamson County Convention and Visitors Bureau. It's a public relations manager, but like you said, it's, it's essentially just telling the story of Franklin and Williamson County to anyone that will listen. So it's a, as, a, as a whole, as the Convention and Visitors Bureau, our, our directive is to invite the world to Williamson County and then invite, come spend their money, but go home. So, <laughs> As we, as we look to do that, we don't produce anything in our office that is a 
a tourism draw. All, we are essentially just the sales and marketing arm for everything else that's being done in the county. So whether it's the Natchez Trace Parkway, which is a massive draw for us, or the ho hotels that are in town and downtown as a whole. Uh, it's Franklin's Main Street. It's a, it's a claim to, across the world, and it is the, the number one draw for people coming to Williamson County. Through studies that we've done in the past, we know that they're coming to visit Main Street, and it's a, its uniqueness, the charm, the mix of food, music, shops, it's a, for so many, it's just a, a step back where they can, like you said about the parkway, you can just kind of slow down and, and take a breath. And it's, a, it does help that we have a Nashville to the north gaining so much attention as the, as the it city, and we complement Nashville so well. We, as a bureau, work so well with Nashville where they have bright lights and big music like the Opry and Ryman. We have the, the singer-songwriter scene and the, the slower pace. So that's, uh, that has allowed us to really promote Franklin and Williamson County as a whole and have an impact on the, the local government and the operations a little bit. So in keeping with the highs, I'll share a little bit of the economic impact and things that tourism has had for us. Uh, unfortunately, our 2017 numbers, they take a little while to compile, so they will come out in early August-ish. So these numbers will be from 2016, but we do expect them to be uh, equally as impressive in, in 2017. So in the year 2016, 1.43 million people came to visit Franklin and Williamson County. And growing over from the previous year, that was a 9.4% increase. Of all of Tennessee's 95 counties, we had the largest increase of percentage-wise of visitation. And those 1.43 million people, as they're coming, they're spending their money, a lot of day trips, a lot more are turning into overnight trips. You see the hotel boom that's kind of happening, and we've been working hard to convert Franklin and Williamson County as a whole from, boy, that is a great day trip. I love spending a few hours there to, boy, that's just not enough time. I gotta get a hotel room and spend two days, three days. So that's, those are our, our continued efforts each day to, to convert us to a two and three days stay. When they're coming, Last, in 2016, they spent 427 and a quarter million dollars. You know, that's, that ranks six in the states in tourism spending. That's behind the Nashvilles, Knoxville, Memphis. Everyone that's above us is bringing in a billion dollars, but they have much larger offerings like Nashville or the Smoky Mountains. So that's, I'm very proud of where Williamson County as a whole ranks as a, as a tourism draw, and we are a kind of head and shoulders above number seven too. So we're in a really solid place in, in our draw for, for tourism across the state. When they're spending all that money, that saves local residents, each household $505 in taxes that you wouldn't have to spend because tourism is coming in and, and providing a little bit of an economic impact. It's also producing over 3,500 jobs. And the thing that I've, I really enjoy seeing about this is in 2015, it was right at 3,000 jobs. So in a year, the tourism industry created almost 500 jobs just within Williamson County. And a lot of that is thanks to a program here at Columbia State. They have a hospitality and tourism program that has started in, in early 2016, and it's bringing in folks who are interested in working in the hospitality industry. And it's not just working at hotels, it's working at restaurants and all the different venues and that are connected to tourism. And it's the, the internship program that they're doing here at Columbia State and the actual curriculum is training the workforce in Williamson County. Because for the tourism industry, a lot of the workforce that are working at our, our hotels, and you're probably gonna see this soon, the, the local workforce, it's kind of hard to come by because there are so many hotels and restaurants and things that are here and just not as many folks to do it. So that's the number one thing we hear from our, our tourism partners is we need more people to work here. So we're working with Columbia State and other local institutions to train more of a workforce. And I love seeing that, that number grows so much in the, in the last year. Speaking of our hotels in 2016, the occupancy rate was right about 75%, which is above the national average, a, a pretty healthy margin. You know, it's daily rates, people were spending $120, and the number that's uh, really important to, to hotel GMs is the, the revenue per available room. So it's per available room, they're making $90, which is very healthy for, for the hotel folks in town. Our visitor center that's located in downtown Main Street and on 4th Avenue, 
almost 46,000 people stopped in there. You know, that's, that's a lot of foot traffic, and they're coming in from various countries. All 50 states were represented in, in 2016 alone, and it's a, a great resource for them to learn what's going on. You know, a lot of travelers are looking on Google and in apps and things for what to do, but there's still a large portion that, that want that little map in their hands or they want to come meet someone that's local and say, so where do you go? And so that's uh, our information specialists there really provide that. And it's, it's a great place for locals as well. You know, it's, uh, aside from art scene events that we host on Friday nights, the, the first of each month, it's, uh, we're also where, where people come to find out what's going on. We, uh, we send out email communications called the local scene. And it's, uh, it's our job to know what's going on all over town. So if, if you're curious what's, what's going on and what you want to do, you know, go to our website and sign up there, and we can we send that out every week, and it's just a full list of every music events, public events, anything fun that's going on. That's a from the the convention side of our convention and visitors bureau. It's a, our sales team meets with meeting planners and, and convention planners across the country. They're a, they're actually out at a show this week with they at 18 different trade shows in 2016. They met with over 400 meeting planners and had them on site showing them Franklin and why we're the place that they should bring their, their corporate meeting, their staff retreats, and their, their small conventions. So between the, the convention center at the Marriott, places like the factory at Franklin and so many of the different unique places, we're really becoming a place that's attractive for business travelers to come in and host their, their meetings and events. That's from my, my angle, my, my daily job is to, to get media outlets and people across the world to tell our story without having to pay for it. So that's a, I'm, I'm constantly pitching Franklin's story and Williamson County's story, and we've, we've been lucky enough to, ha to have a few high points in the last couple of years of some, some pretty good name media outlets talking about us, naming us things like the best southern town and the 10 best main streets in the USA. and. You know, places like the New York Times calling you a small town gym, that's just uh, advertising we couldn't afford to buy. You know, we're not going to buy billboards in Times Square and things like that. But if we can get them to talk about us, it really starts to generate that buzz about Franklin. And in the year 1617, we did all right in, in how our tracking went. We got 371 million media impressions, which had we bought that advertising wise, that would have been $4.4 million worth of spending we would have had to done for advertising. This year we've had a pretty good year so far. Uh, so we're already over 2.1 billion media impressions and that would have cost us $17.2 million in advertising to promote Franklin and Williamson County had we just been doing ad dollars and ad spends that way. Uh, a lot of that comes from our partners talking about us too. And it does help when guys like Justin Timberlake stand on a stage at Pilgrimage and say, I love Franklin, Tennessee, over and over. So that's, that, that game garners a little attention. And, and he, he wore his Pilgrimage Festival shirt and all those Super Bowl ads and things like that. So it's targeting the right folks who can continue to say our message for us, too, really helps us be a, make the most out of our, our advertising and, and promotions of Franklin. And... One of the real high points that started in 2016 is our ambassador program, and that's taking folks here, locals. It started as, a, you know, for hospitality and folks, frontline folks, your waitress, your person who's greeting you at the hotels. You know, as I mentioned a lot of them aren't from Franklin, Williamson County, and when people were getting dinner, they're saying, so what should I do? Where do you recommend I go? Well, we like Nashville, but we don't want folks saying, I'll run up, drive up the road and spend your money there. We want them to be able to tell about the historic Civil War homes here, or to go visit the Natchez Trace Parkway Bridge, visit Main Street, and the different things like that. So we offer a free program for hospitality industry folks and community members that want to participate. Half day, you kind of get a classroom style lesson of all things Franklin, Williamson County, tourism, the, the, the hot attractions around town, and then take a field trip around the county, and you go experience a lot of these. And then you, you get a, you know, lapel pin that says you're a certified ambassador and you, 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 just, you have this knowledge with you that when people ask you in the restaurant, so where should I go? You can say, boy, I, you should go this place, that place, and you can just rattle it off. And we, we know that the visitors that are coming here are getting that, that down home, genuine experience that we really want them to experience while they're here. And so 
since we're talking about high points, that's of literal high points in our tourism offerings, the first one that came to mind was Soar Adventure Tower. And it's, it's you can literally climb multiple stories up to the top and get a, a, a unique view of, of Cool Springs. And you, on a clear day, you can see into downtown Franklin from there. But that really highlights uh, the family traveler. You know, it's a, Franklin, it's well established as a business traveler coming midweek and families were coming down for one day road trips and things like that, but we're, we're really growing that offering for things for kids and families to do, you know, between the historic Civil War homes, fun things like SOAR and the different trampoline parks, we're seeing a, a huge push for families making Franklin their destination and making trips into Nashville to experience instead of vice versa. And then uh, talking about the, the Civil War sites, you know, Carter Hill provides that great scenic overlook of, of the entire, you know, the whole battlefield area where you can really get a good glimpse of the, the Civil War homes. And so they, those Civil War homes are drawing over 100,000 people per year to come through and, and see them. So the Battle of Franklin is obviously one of our, our huge draws and that, that educational component that you were, were speaking to. They do a wonderful job of, of telling that story of the battle, how the families were were involved, what it meant for Franklin, and the, the entire story of, of the Civil War. And so uh, those are some of our, our biggest high points. Okay. Right. Well, thank you all for sharing. If we can just ask maybe one more question yeah. as we round out the, our time today. Steve, have you ever climbed one of the uh, cranes? <laughs> <laughs> they won't let me. <laughs> We've tried to get up there, and Russ and our office tried to get up there, but insurance wouldn't let us. So. Okay, okay. Well, um, another question. What do you hope will surprise people um, the most about the Hartford Square development? I think they'll be surprised, or maybe not surprised, but of the quality that we've put into this. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to build a project uh, as a legacy deal, so we could make decisions that took a long time to pay off. For example, we did an analysis whether we would go leads or not, and uh, it, it would take us eight years to pay for the gold leads program. Well, we were able to say, yes, we want that. It's just because we were able to, uh, we have a, a legacy project that we hope to own for a long time. So I think, I think people, when they come visit, will really uh, be taken back about the quality that we're putting into it. Thank you. Tony, one more question, a couple more questions if you don't mind. Um, is there anything else you can think of that you may not have said earlier um, on why someone should slow down and take the time to enjoy the trace? Well, because there's no place like it in the world. It's one of the most beautiful places, I think, to visit. And if you're going too fast, you're going to miss out on a lot that's, that's there to enjoy. So I would encourage people just to slow down. That's what the rangers will tell you if you're going too fast. They'll say, and after they give you the ticket, they'll say, just slow down. <laughs> and, um, Come back, come back when you've got more time to enjoy this. One more question, okay. and you know, I have to ask, is the Natchez Trace haunted? There are people who say that the Natchez Trace is haunted. That's, um, I could tell you, like, that's a whole different segment, I could tell you some of the stories, but uh, there are people who say that it is. Matt, um, how can we, as a Williamson County community, be more welcoming to our visitors. Gosh, doing a really good job already. And it's, a, it's hard to, to walk downtown. It's a, a, a funny story as some of our staff members have, you know, they'll see someone holding a map on, on Main Street and clearly a, a tourist looking for something to do, try to walk up to them, can't get to them in time because a local has already stopped and, and done that. And that's, that's happened many times. But the things like the ambassador program and, and and just general knowledge of knowing that, you know, we have a lot of really neat things to offer around here. It's, it's not just a history town, not just a music town, not just a, a charming southern village. It, it's all of them, and it's a, just a, almost like a cornucopia of great little things all here in our community. That's well put. Um, what has been your best day on the job with the Williamson County Chamber and Visitors Bureau? There have been a lot of really fun ones, and I, Gosh, honestly, just one last week might have been it. Got a, of course, British Airways has just launched a new flight from London to Nashville direct. And through our, uh, through our ambassador program, we have a lot of the concierge in Nashville hotels come down and do that. And one from the Hutton Hotel had been 
through the program. She had a, a reporter staying with her that was doing a story on the flight. She was, had one more day, they were looking for things for her to do, and she said, you've got to go down to Franklin and, and check that out. <laughs> so it's, I was driving into work, she called me and said, I just sent a reporter your way, she's going to be there, I would try to get there before she does. And <laughs> turns out it was Kay Burley, who is the equivalent of like Lester Holt or David Muir. She's on Sky News, the number one network in London, also writes a travel piece for the Daily Mail, which just happens to be the largest website in the world. She came and spent a, an entire day in Franklin is doing a, a whole piece on us just because we made a nice impression with a concierge and turns out she's going to be a, a big, a lifelong Franklin fan. And fun anecdote, she had to leave us on a red-off flight that night, go straight to the Kensington Palace and interview the Queen. <laughs> so, <laughs> her, her Instagram stories were very unique there for 24 hours, from Leapers Fork to Kensington Palace. Well, that's great. Now, um, tell us how we can get involved in the um, Franklin Ambassador Program as far as going to your website. That's, that's visitfranklin.com slash ambassador. So, right there is the, the easiest way you can sign up. It's, it happens once a month, the, the first Tuesday of each month, and uh, this month is already sold out, but we're offering classes through October. And I'll also say, is, as you're out taking pictures and posting things on social media, hashtag them FranklinTN. So that's, we'll, as you go to our website, you'll see we curate those all over, and that's all user-generated content that folks are talking about us. And, and Tony, you mentioned that we have um, some great brochures right. for... Um, your upcoming event on June the 2nd. That's right, and we'd love to have everybody become a member of the Natchez Trace Parkway Association. Our website is natchestrace.org. Okay, and we have some brochures out in the lobby um, once you leave. And Steve, anything else you'd like to say on behalf of Harper Square? Well, we're opening June 1st, 2019. Come see us. Great, great. Well, thank you all for attending Frank Talks today. Most of our Franklin Tomorrow events are free, but we would like to ask you to support us, not only with your donations, but through two unique opportunities. You can get a historic Franklin license plate when you renew your car tags, and Franklin Tomorrow receives a portion of the proceeds. And I like to tell people when they brag about the fact that they have one, make sure your second car has one. And second, um, your companies and individuals can support Franklin Tomorrow by signing up to be a whole sponsor for our October 3rd Mayor's Cup Golf Tournament. And it's $250 to be a whole sponsor. And we have this information also outside. And you're also welcome to see Carmen. Um, if you would like to uh, know more about the opportunities. And I'd also like to put a plug if you'd like to get involved with us. Carmen is the woman to uh, contact. And um, even though Mindy wasn't here, she's out representing us with the Planning Commission, um, we were still able to have Frank Talks thanks to the incredible support that we received from Renaissance Bank, from, um, from Lynn, and I see Lynn in the back, um, as well as through um, Columbia, uh, state and thank you again for our wonderful community coffee. Thank you guys for being here today and we'll look forward to seeing you next month.